Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our next lecturer. Uh, um, Donata Giglio is a uh, assistant professor at the University of Colorado. Um, she uh, um, worked as a, a postdoctoral uh, scholar at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, and uh, her interests are mainly focused on large scale ocean dynamics, ASC interactions, and geophysical fluid dynamics. Um, and uh, one of her favorite foods is sushi. Donata, I'm looking very forward to your talk. Thank you, Judith, for the introduction. And thank you to you, Anish, and the program for inviting me to give this lecture. Hi, everyone. Today, I will be talking about ocean observations for S2S. Before I start, I would like to thank all that contributed to the studies that are cited in these presentations. And if you are interested, there will be references in the slides. So we will start with some basics on why we care about ocean observations for S2S. We will then discuss what observations are available versus desirable. And um, at the end, I would like to briefly discuss uncertainty quantification in gridded oce oceanic fields that are based on observation. So the goal is here to improve understanding, modeling, and forecasting of S2S variability, have you, as you have heard um, last week and uh, also today. And ocean observations, as we will see in this talk, are important for this, as um, they are they provide uh, the ocean is a source of uh, predictability. The community has seen that um, coupled atmosphere ocean modeling and data simulation may be actually key to forecast S2S uh, variability. This is obviously important, as you have heard um, at the beginning of last week as many critical decisions need to be made several weeks to months in advance. For instance, uh, for naval and commercial shipping, we um, want to be able to design um, the shipping routes weeks in advance to take advantage of favorable condition to avoid hazards. For drought forecast, it's important for farmers to know in advance um, about the forecast, so to make um, the best decision in terms of which seed variety uh, to use. Finally, one last example, um, water uh, resource management. The, the decisions about reservoir levels have to be made weeks, months, and seasons in advance um, of the actual uh, usage of the water. We all know that we are facing a climate crisis and as a result of this, there are more severe and frequent extreme events that are developing. Uh, NOAA has recently published uh, a report that underscores the importance of uh, ocean observations for uh, forecasting, including uh, for forecasting uh, at S2S time scales. And quoting directly from this report that was published in May, uh, NOAA uh, states that NOAA must embark on a new way of doing business by fully integrating the ocean observing communities with its weather, water, and climate programs in order to provide society with state of the science, actionable data information and services. Noah goes on to elaborate on this and to point out how the insufficient integration of the ocean observations in numerical models is a clear limiting factor for improving the skill of earth system prediction. And this is across time scales, including uh, S2S. In the report, they show one summary uh, graphic uh, for the importance of integrating, uh, better integrating ocean observations in uh, model and data simulation efforts uh, to predict, uh, to improve uh, the forecast on different time scales. In particular, they show uh, this graphic where uh, on the horizontal axis, you can see time um, here specifically. On the vertical axis, the number of events that are billion dollar disaster events in the United States during the period 1980 to 2021. And on the right, you see the cost in billions um, as a consequence of uh, these events. 
One thing that the NOAA uh, report points out, and I would like you to pay attention to looking at this uh, graphic, is that 2020 was the sixth consecutive year in which 10 or more billion dollar disaster events have impacted the United States. This is clearly um, a very uh, important topic uh, for society. And uh, NOAA in this report describes the strategic goal to improve uh, NOAA Earth System prediction to provide more accurate and I quote, reliable and timely forecast across time scales. And to do this, um, they uh, highlight the focus of closing gaps in ocean observations and also better integrating the available ocean observations into numerical uh, models. Here on the right, you see a schematic of the strategic objectives uh, that are described in this NOAA report. And you can see how uh, aligning, enhancing and maintaining ocean observation is uh, one of the key points on the right. But let's think about why, um, why this is, why this focus on ocean observation. So the subsurface ocean stores and releases heat. And uh, this is the key uh, reason to understand the important role that the ocean plays in regulating um, climate. The upper ocean is a major reservoir of heat energy for both weather um, and uh, the climate system. If we want to think about some numbers and, and, and think of an example that um, in one sentence describes this, if we think about the top 100 meter of ocean, the top 100 meter of ocean have 40 times the heat capacity of the entire atmosphere. And you may have heard of um, the heat capacity of the ocean in the context of climate change. Um, the climate is changing, as we're all aware, due to the fact that the input, the energy input to the climate system is uh, greater than the energy that exits the climate system. But where does this heat uh, go? Um, the oceans actually take up more than 90% of the energy that is added to the climate system by humans. For comparison, the atmosphere takes up 2%. You may have seen this schematic on the right uh, from the IPCC report, where on the horizontal axis you have the year, on the vertical axis, you have the energy. And this graph shows how the different components of the climate system, the energy stored in different components of the climate system has changed over time. Uh, you can see um, prominently how um, most of the energy has been stored in the upper and deep ocean. So this would be the light and dark blue shading. But let's think of an example. Um, that has been uh, discussed um, also during this workshop for S2S uh, forecast. Let's think about where tropical cyclones get their energy from. Um, tropical cyclones get their energy from uh, the ocean. We have that water evaporates and uh, latent heat goes into the atmosphere. Once this water uh, condenses, this heat is released and um, fuels the tropical cyclone. And if, if you're, um, there is a nice uh, video uh, that explains this mechanism and you can easily find it either looking at the link down here or literally Googling where do hurricanes get energy, get their energy from. Uh, this is a, a NASA video and I encourage you all to, uh, to look at this animation. We can see uh, the effect um, out, out the ocean changes as a tropical cyclone comes through. Here we have one example uh, for um, tropical cyclone Harvey in 2017. We have a map on the left with the track of, um, of Harvey. And then uh, the color is the maximum sustained winds in knots. And you can see that there are also these magenta stars on the map. And these are um, ocean observations from the Argo array that are co-located with, uh, with the track. So these are uh, Argo profiles, basically. If we look, if we focus um, on the Argo profiles that are available next to the track, close to the track in the Gulf of Mexico, we can look at how um, the ocean changes between before and after uh, the cyclone. And this is actually uh, included here on the right. So on the right, we have a graph with temperature on the horizontal axis, uh, pressure on the vertical axis. And you can think of um, pressure in decibel as a depth in meters, more or less. Um, and what you can see is that if you compare 
the profile before the tropical cyclone with profiles after the tropical cyclone. So you clearly see this cooling. And, and if you're interested in um, learning more about Hurricane Harvey, uh, I encourage you to uh, look at the publication by Trenberg uh, et al. in 2018, which describes uh, all the observations that are available uh, during Hurricane uh, Harvey. And, and if you're interested in more in general to look at um, how the ocean uh, changes as the tropical cyclone uh, comes through, uh, you can um, look at these kind of plots for other hurricanes using the Argovis uh, web app and database and the Python notebook uh, that is uh, in this that you can find in this GitHub repository uh, down here. The ocean um, is very important to understand uh, how um, tropical cyclones uh, evolve and uh, to uh, improve forecast of, for instance, tropical cyclone energy. Um, here, uh, I, I wanted to show, I want to show one study that compares the anomaly correlation scale of forecast of tropical cyclone energy at days 16 to 45. So what you see in this map are different regions and then uh, bars that represent the anomaly correlation scale uh, at these um, uh, lead times. And the different color of the bars indicates a different kind of experiments. In one case, the orange bars um, represent what happens, uh, what the correlation scale is if we initialize the ocean using all the observations available in the observing system. And then we have the green uh, bars that instead show what happens uh, to the scale if we do not uh, include in the initial condition uh, the information from altimetry. And you can see that uh, in almost all cases, the orange bars are taller than the green bars, indicating the importance of ocean observations to uh, better initialize uh, the ocean and achieve uh, a better forecast. Another example um, is for um, seasonal uh, forecast in uh, the tropical Pacific, specifically a seasonal forecast of El Nino. Uh, we are all familiar with the normal conditions in the tropical Pacific and specifically the warm water volume uh, in the Western uh, Pacific. And um, different studies have showed that the recharge and discharge of this warm water volume in the tropical Pacific is closely related to Enso variability. So accurate observations of the evolution of this warm water volume can help to improve Enso process understanding, first of all, and predictions on seasonal time scales. This is uh, one example that we have heard uh, last week um, about two uh, ocean observations are key to better understand and represents in models air sea interactions. Uh, we uh, have heard about the MGO and the propagation uh, of the MGO, particularly uh, through the maritime continent seas, and um, understanding uh, those air sea interactions in these regions uh, are key to um, understand the propagation of the MGO through the region. And this is a, a part of the of the world where we um, haven't had historically a, a lot of observations. And uh, the um, international program here, so the maritime continent, has uh, provided for the period 2017-2020 uh, long-needed observations in these regions that uh, are helpful to better understand Earth's interaction. Finally, um, I want to mention sea ice-related predictions. These uh, need to have uh, good initial conditions in terms of upper ocean currents, temperature, surface radiation, and heat fluxes, surface wind, wave eye. We need observation uh, at the edge of the ice. We need observations uh, in the marginal uh, ice zone. And increasing the amount of observations we have in time will allow us to do a better job at predicting extreme events like the unprecedented springtime retreat in Antarctica, uh, in Antarctic uh, sea ice in 2016. We have a schematic, uh, a graph uh, showing that uh, here on the bottom. On the horizontal axis, we have the month in 2016. On the vertical axis, we have sea ice extent. And if we compare the, the mean 
for the period 1979 to 2015, which is the black line, with the red line that is for 2016, we see this unprecedented springtime uh, retreat, which we would want to be able, uh, events like these are events that we would want to be able to uh, do a better job at forecasting. So to summarize, we really need ocean observations to understand Earth's interactions and uh, the role of Earth's interaction in S2S variability and prediction. We need ocean observations to improve uh, S2S forecast in high and mid latitudes, including sea ice predictions, as we just discussed. And also the NOAA report that I mentioned earlier uh, highlights how the ocean um, is uh, among the most poorly known and understood components of uh, the Earth system. And this is largely uh, due to the sparseness of the data, to the difficulty to, um, to do measurements in certain regions or in certain oceanic layers. So what observations are needed in light of what we discussed so far? We want observations of the ocean atmosphere interface, and we want these observations to be simultaneous measurement of the ocean and the atmosphere. We want observations in the subsurface, um, just a few examples, upper ocean uh, current and temperature, mixed layer depth and properties, ocean boundary currents, and we want high resolution observations in ocean boundary currents, um, which are, um, which provide um, a resource of predictability uh, for um, S2S uh, variability. We want measurements of way, uh, height, in and around the marginalized zone. We want observations uh, below uh, the sea ice. We want observations uh, that capture um, the processes of sea ice growth and uh, retreat. Um, and we want observations of uh, sea ice thickness and concentration. So what observations are available at this point in time? Here are some examples. Uh, we have, uh, for instance, moorings that provide a lot of information with a high temporal resolution uh, yet they have the limitation of um, being observations at a single site and uh, maintaining the mooring is expensive. Uh, this is particularly challenging if uh, we are in a region where uh, there is a strong current, but moorings are um, a, a key source of information for FC fluxes, uh, for instance. Um, they are a key source of information for uh, diurnal variability because they provide the resolution that is needed to describe diurnal variability. We have gliders that are uh, a key source of information uh, for um, regions where we need high resolution measurements. I mentioned earlier uh, boundary currents and gliders are very helpful uh, at doing that. Uh, we have um, more recently we have had uh, sail drones and, and these instruments, as we will discuss in a second, are um, very um, very useful uh, for instance to supplement um, the information in regions where we have moorings to provide uh, information about the gradients between moorings uh, surface drifters uh, they provide a view a global view of mixed layer um, currents um, near surface temperature and sea level atmospheric pressure we have ship data that uh, although they are sparse in they are concentrated along specific lines and uh, the sampling along these lines is um, sparse in time. The sections are repeated uh, only or every so often. If we think about, for instance, the, the Go Ship uh, program, that is um, a key resource of information for, um, for the global ocean. This kind of network is, is key, uh, not only uh, for the measurements that it provides directly and can be analyzed to study changes um, climate changes, uh, for instance, but also these are key to provide a gold standard to uh, assure that um, arrays like the Argo, um, the Argo array of profiling floats remain at uh, best quality, provide best quality data. Uh, the Argo floats um, have uh, provided an unprecedented um, coverage of the global ocean in space and time. Here, if we uh, look at the map on the top right, these are dots that show the location of Argo profiles collected in a three-day window. And just looking at this map, you can realize the, the magnitude of um, the, the revolution that, that Argo has initiated. Obviously, satellites are also uh, key to um, gather information on a global scale. They have provided unprecedented coverage, uh, spatially and temporally. So we have these observations and we um, you know, shouldn't give them for granted if we think about 
uh, what we had in the past. Um, for instance, if you think about what we had for temperature casts per, per one degree box, uh, where uh, if you think about casts that profile at least to 900 meters, uh, and we uh, put together all the casts available from the world in the World Ocean Database uh, for the years before year 2000, we end up with a map like this, where uh, the black, and, and we see a lot of black and, and blue um, dots in this map, indicate that there are only, uh, in the case of the black color, uh, one uh, cast uh, per one degree box. In the case of the blue um, color, two to five uh, casts um, in, in, a, in a one degree box. And these are all the observations available uh, over time up to year 2000. Uh, especially in the Southern Ocean, there is um, a scarcity uh, of data, as you can see from this map. Even if you include the initial years of Argo, you still see that the Southern Ocean um, is not well covered. And, and now, if you compare instead with how much observations we are, avail we are um, able to collect now, in particular, these are the number of observations for years 2015 and 16. So in only two years, we can now do a much better job at observing the ocean uh, on a global scale. And uh, especially, we can do a better job in the Southern Hemisphere. So finally, I want to show um, the casts from uh, glider data. I mentioned earlier how gliders are very important to uh, observe gradients in uh, boundary uh, current systems. And um, these are the gliders uh, in um, the World Ocean Database. And we can see uh, where uh, these data are available. I mentioned about uh, sail drones and how uh, promising and useful these instruments uh, are. These, these instruments are autonomous surface vehicles um, that basically sail uh, in the ocean and are um, sun powered. Uh, the, the instruments on board are sun powered. And this can be uh, used to um, target specific events. If we think about El Nino development, these uh, sail drones could capture. Um, could, could make measurements during the linear development. And, and as I mentioned earlier, they can supplement other uh, sources of observations. They could cover gradients in between uh, fixed moorings, uh, for example. So we want to make, um, to increase the use of sail drones. Um, there are, of course, these, these sail drones have been used in uh, specific uh, projects and, and studies. We want to increase the use of these observations, which can uh, the soil drones can provide both observations in the surface of the ocean and in the upper ocean and in, in the atmosphere. So this co-located information, simultaneous observations of the ocean and the atmosphere are uh, very important. Uh, also, we uh, want to um, think about new mission and concepts to in enhance the range of information that are available for, uh, from space. Um, the current satellites um, do not provide uh, measurements for all the surface variables that are needed to estimate air sea fluxes. And, and I mentioned many times today how important it is to have simultaneous measurements of uh, the ocean and the atmosphere to um, have a better description of air sea fluxes. And uh, concepts like the butterfly concepts uh, are um, proposed to move, um, to, to advance in this direction. Also, um, satellites, most of the satellites measure at the, uh, a couple of times per day at any fixed uh, location. And we want to have instead multiple satellites uh, that have similar objectives but measure uh, at one location for at different times of the day so that we can describe the urinal variability and the scales of fast moving uh, synoptic storms. Uh, finally, I mentioned we need more observations, um, many more observations of uh, the marginal um, ice zone, uh, more observations at the edge uh, of the sea ice to better understand um, sea ice growth and retreat. So, okay, let, let's see. Um, I have a few more minutes and I would like in this uh, remaining time to um, discuss a bit about um, one more uh, use of observations beyond what we have heard 
um, a lot so far in terms of assimilating these observations in um, data simulating uh, models. So obviously that's uh, a very important uh, part, a very important uh, use of ocean observations. Uh, another uh, way ocean observations are, use, uh, are useful is to produce uh, gridded products that uh, can be helpful to assess ocean reanalysis and improve the initial state of the ocean for S2S forecast. As Magdalena and other uh, speakers have uh, described, this is uh, of key importance to uh, improve S2S forecast. So when we um, have, when we think about Argo profiles, for instance, uh, I, I mentioned how Argo has provided unprecedented coverage in space and time. Uh, we have uh, more than 2 million profiles. How do we go from these uh, profiles to uh, not only gridded products, which we have quite a few uh, out there, but gridded products that come with meaningful uncertainties? How do we do that and what are the challenges? Um, so if we think of the example of um, field of ocean heat content estimates, uh, that is um, of key importance, obviously, because we know that, as I described in the beginning, we know that the ocean has taken up more than 90% of the excess energy in the climate system. So we want to be able to do uh, a good job at estimating how uh, the ocean heat content changes over time and uh, estimating the uncertainty of net ocean heat content. The challenges are that there are different sources of uncertainty and not uh, all of this, and, not for, uh, and we haven't uh, yet uh, produced the products that take into account all these different sources of uncertainty. So one uh, source of uncertainty is the quality control of the data. And as Magdalena pointed out, this could be a problem also for um, assimilation of the data uh, into a model. If bad data are assimilated, that will degrade um, the, what we can tell using the model. There are errors in bias correction for some data. And um, one example is for the XBT um, data. Uh, in the past, we have, as Magdalena mentioned, special temporal uh, data sampling density that changes over time. This is just one schematic um, to sh that shows on the horizontal axis, the year on the vertical axis, the number of casts uh, per year. And as you can see, as um, the Argo array and the glider um, kick in, we have uh, a large increase in the number of available observations. And, and this is uh, challenging, uh, not only for um, data simulating system, as Madalena described, is also challenging when uh, producing uh, maps. Another key, um, key component uh, to, to this that um, we need to, to consider is when we uh, map these observations, one of the first steps is to generally to remove a baseline climatology. The choices that we make in um, for that baseline climatology have impact on um, the end product and uh, have impacts on whether some of the assumptions of the method that then we use to map the residuals are met or not. Uh, but uh, let's have um, a look uh, for this. Uh, for the trend, for instance, of the data. For ocean heat content, this is a very relevant, um, very important question. What's the trend in ocean heat content? And this trend, um, if you use cross-validation, you can show that uh, not including a trend in this baseline climatology leads to an underestimate of uh, the actual warming trend. So the choice we make have uh, are very important for the end result. Uh, also, the choice of mapping method. Uh, you could think of going with a very simple box average uh, versus objective mapping. This in, has impacts on both the estimates and even more on um, the usability of the uncertainties that you can produce along with that estimate. Uh, you can um, make choices about um, how to estimate the decorrelation scales. Um, and this, again, has implications on, um, on what happens next. Finally, uh, one um, source of uncertainty is the spatial temporal correlation of the measurements. And um, in, a, in a recent uh, work uh, that I'm doing with collaborators, we, we have seen that using uh, local conditional simulation 
can help to uh, provide uncertainty with, with the estimate with, uh, that are uh, taking into account the spatial temporal correlation of the measurements. So to summarize, uh, we need to design and implement uh, low cost, high value surface and subsurface ocean observations. And not only that, uh, so we need to, of course, maintain the observations we have. We need to enhance these observations, adding uh, more measurements, especially to capture um, high gradients uh, in um, regions that are sources of predictability. But also we need to develop forecasting systems that are capable of extracting uh, the observations potential in forecast applications. We uh, want to um, take advantage, use what we know from um, the models to also uh, guide the design of uh, observing system. We want to combine the information uh, from the uh, observational oceanography with the modeling community to design the best uh, observing system uh, for the future. The, as I uh, try to highlight the, today, uh, S2S forecasts will benefit from high spatial temporal resolution in regions that are sources of predictability, and these include coastal regions, uh, tropical regions, and polar regions. I made the example of gliders and how useful they are in boundary current systems to uh, capture uh, strong gradients, for instance, in sea surface temperature, uh, in near surface temperature. We want to um, think beyond the current technology and advance um, current technology uh, to uh, observe the ocean atmosphere interface simultaneously using autonomous vehicles, but also um, potentially doing this from, from space. And finally, um, we discussed briefly about uh, observations-based gridded products and the importance of producing observation-based grid, uh, gridded products that have meaningful uncertainty so that we can assess ocean reanalysis and improve the initial state of the ocean, which is uh, important for S2S uh, forecast. So I will stop here and uh, take questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Donata. Very interesting aspects about um, ocean observations.